Welcome, adventurers. Ow! This is the Philomythia Podcast. <laughs> well, damn, I'm going to have to say it. Welcome. Welcome. To the F- F- Philomythia Podcast. My name is Ian. My name is Eric. We fooled you. It's not true. Or is it? Maybe. Wait to the end of the podcast to find out. Yeah. Ooh, plant mysteries. Like the Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master says, Ooh. start strong. Start, start strong. strong. Give it a strong start there. Oh, bro. Oh, so good. So, so good. first of all, I have things to say that you just that we talked about, but let's give anyone listening up front right now. Today's episode... Spoiler alert. Spoilers. Like, Big, fat, like, huge. meta spoilers. Like, a spoiler of spoilers. Let's right. Say. We're talking about a crazy villain that's existed through all of d and Icon. Who is that, Eric? Uh, it is Vecna. Vecna is kind of making a splash once again because he... In a, ver- a version of him is the villain of the latest season of Stranger Things. Right. And uh, Wizards of the Coast just released a new stat block with some mythology updates for Vecna that you can get for free if you have a D&D Beyond account. So we just felt like it was a good time to dig into Vecna. Vecna is no longer free on D&D Beyond. Oh, really? I, yeah. I claimed it, so... Right. Uh, it ended like a day or two ago. So if you claimed it, then uh, so I got the window. Oh, yeah. I guess it's not free. Do we know how what the price is offhand? I don't know because I also claimed it. Well, that's a bummer. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I claimed it. Now these spoilers will allude to Critical Role season one as well. Critical Role season one, uh, the three Vecna adventures that were published in the '90s and 2000 as right. well. And if you haven't seen Stranger Things season four, yeah, uh, we may say stuff about it. Yeah. So I'm going to give just a rundown of some of the origins of Vecna. I know you've got like a... I've got way too much. But I just want to say right at the outset that digging into Vecna really helped me discover my passion and fascination. Not with like the mythology of like a campaign world like Faroon or... Alexandria or... Was it Athos, the Dark Sun Mm. campaign world like i love some of that but it's the mythology of the creatures and items and things that carry on uh through every edition of D&D, like a vecna or a rod of seven parts and how those have evolved and they have this life of their own that transcends any one edition or campaign world yeah and that stuff because it emerges out of um people playing the game right i just love that it's a very organic interesting weird thing but i think that that also entails like just a small thing like Mm -hmm. people who like started take for example second edition Mm -hmm. and let's say third edition comes out and they like third edition and they play third edition with their friends so one of the gms is like holy shit there was this thing in second edition Mm -hmm. that i loved yeah so they bring it into third so like it's that type of thing where these people have loved these certain mythologies that came out wherever and they like grandfather them into the next worlds and it just keeps yeah. happening over and over. Yeah. I love that. It's really cool. And it's it also plays into this modern d d idea of what the multiverse is now where there's echoes of these archetypes throughout every world and throughout yeah. the multiverse. Um, like a Tiamat or a Loth right. oh, or yeah. a Vecna or you know any of these um, um, what's the blade the evil intelligent weapon the one you used or uh black razor right yeah, i use a variation of it things like that that uh that that to me it's kind of like final fantasy always has chocobos it always has yeah. these marks D has these things that it's the mythology of D in my mind yeah like the thing that carries over that gives D its identity as apart from Tunnels and Trolls or Pathfinder. Mm. But Pathfinder obviously is an echo. It has a lot of things in in, uh, in common. Yeah, for sure. So let's start with the name. Vecna is an anagram, which means they took the letters and they mixed them around, of Vance. And Vance refers to Jack Vance, who was a writer kind of back in the day, I think early 1900s, like first half of the century. I could be a little wrong about that, but he was writing pulp kind of sci-fi stuff around the same time as a guy uh, who wrote the Conan books was writing stuff, Robert Howard. Oh, right. I think they were contemporaries. Um, he, When we talk about D&D and Jack Vance, he's really known for his Dying Earth series, which is Earth, 
so far in the future and a civilization that was so advanced that now has just gone kaputs. So they don't know what technology is. For them, they're so far into the post-apocalyptic future that it's become magic again. It's like Numenera. Yeah, and I actually have that written down as Numenera has echoes of this or Dark Sun. Mm. The dying earth is uh, cooking slowly in uh, the slow heat death. I think it's either of the sun or the universe. I don't remember which one. But the whole... Basically, reality is slowly falling apart. Um, And so you find this trope in kind of gonzo, sword and sorcery, low magic, weirdness, and also where things kind of cross. So you have science fiction blending with fantasy. So, for instance, uh, what is the... Oh, the adventure expedition to the Barrier Peaks. And again, spoiler spoiler alert, this is a a AD&D adventure from the 80s Mm. where... This duke hires the party to go clear out this cave of monsters, but the cave is actually an opening to a spaceship. Oh. And you have to get, like, key cards and fight robots, and it's very kind of science fantasy. That's really cool. Yeah, so Dying Earth is in that vein, and that's also where we get the term Vancy and magic, which is what a D&D originally used as its magic system, and we kind of pay lip service to now with spell slots, which is the idea that each spell is actually this living demon... And what the magician or wizard does is they train their minds to contain this demon in their mind like a genie in a bottle. In a bottle, And when they speak the magic words, they release that demon, which gives it the spell effect. So it's completely weird and wacky and That's really crazy. right in that trope. It's not really what we do. We don't think about spells like in that way anymore. And we've actually talked about that, I think, yeah. like on a way earlier episode. So... Jack Vance um, is Vecna. well. It's a it's a nod to Vance's influence in the game. Right. It's so cool. Yeah. So Numenera, um, Empire of the Petal Throne, which actually the guy who was creating that world, it predates D and D. But when D and D came out, he was like, "Oh, I can use this system to play in my campaign world." But that one kind of um, it's kind of like Midkemia from the Magician, Apprentice, and Master books. Oh, okay. Uh, What is it called? The um, Rift War books by uh, Raymond E. Feist. They kind of have a South American, Mesoamerican vibe. Nice. And then there's Michael Moorcock's Eternal Champion series. So these are all kind of that same flavor. And there's Elric, Hawkmoon, and Quorum. These are books I wanted to read for a long time, but it's very confusing what the reading order is, and they're very hard to get all of them in one place, even on Audible. Oh, They're hard to just... You're like, which one do I start with? I don't know what's going on. But Coram specifically, some some he's on his adventures. He falls into the sea. He gets caught by this net. And he fa- finds this giant hand with six fingers. And he finds this multifaceted eye, like an insect Holy eye. Holy shit. He uses the eye and the hand. Um, and so, like, uh, Colville... A big credit to Matthew Colville's video on Vecna. And also... Uh, Jordan, the PH is silent, as he likes to say, his series on Vecna. He actually talks through all three adventures. Oh, nice. Uh, and so, I big credit to them. I, I use those videos. I will link to those videos. You should watch them. Very good. Um, when Colville uses Vecna, he actually flavors the eye and the hand in this fashion oh. because of these books. And I'm like, that's really cool. Um, and also, the idea of law and chaos comes from uh, the Eternal Champion series as well. So, um, Vecna started out as two magic items in a book called Eldritch Wizardry. Now, this blew my mind. Guess what else came out of this module? It was called Supplement 3 Eldritch Wizardry. It came out, I think, in the early 80s. So, you get the Druid class. Oh! You get Psionics. You get Orcus. You get the Demogorgon. You get the Rod of Seven Parts and the Axe of the Dwarvish Lords all in this one supplement for the first time. That's wild. Yeah, because those are all like... It's iconic stuff. Still very relevant things. Um, psionics. Are coming back. Wizards of the Coast. That's all I want to say. Psionics. Oh, yeah. Bring bastards. Um, and Vecna didn't actually get an adventure until 1990 with um, second edition D&D with Vecna Lives. And there's three adventures. Vecna Lives, written by uh, Dave Zeb Cook, who was around, I think, even in the 70s. He was around for a long time. Vecna Reborn, which is really hard to find online. 
Uh, that was written by Monty Cook, the prolific uh, maker of Numenera and also Tolis, that crazy like 600-page book that's all one city. Oh, and he wrote a book I'll talk a little bit about called The Book of Violent Darkness, which we'll get into. Yes, which is associated with Vecna. Yeah. And it may have come from Vecna Reborn, because that's when Vecna is trapped in the dread, domains of mm, dread. Okay. And he's trying to get out. And then Die Vecna Die in 2000, that was Bruce Cordell and Steve Miller. So cool. Um, so Vecna comes from the world of Greyhawk, which looks like O-Earth, but I actually found out, I read this book called Game Wizards, which is about the history of d d It's written by John Peterson, who co-authored Art and Arcana and Heroes Feast, and wrote a book called Playing at the World, which I've been trying to get my hands on, but there's not a audiobook, but it's another history book. Mm. But he actually... <laughs> He says that Orth is actually pronounced as if you had a New York accent. So Orth is supposed to be Oith. Oh, interesting. Oith. That's how you actually pronounce <laughs> it. Which I'm like, that's actually kind of amazing. And Oith is actually an alternate version of Earth. Gygax, when he created the map, made it to fit a two-panel map that you could print in a book. Mm. And he just basically took a part, at least part of Earth and just basically changed some of the ge- geography, put different towns in there, all that kind of thing. And at some point, for uh, reasons, because he wanted the trademark back, he, he destroyed Oith and that became came back as like Yorth or something. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And then, his, like you were just talking about, uh, his secrets, like his powers supposedly are kept in the Book of Vile Darkness, which he apparently wrote parts of. Right. Not the whole thing. So, interestingly enough, he, his name became unspeakable like another wizard that uh, is fairly popular now, which is Voldemort. Right. So he was known as the Whispered One, the Master of the Iron Throne, the Undying King, or the Lord of the Rotted Tower. Yeah. Did you, did you ever run into Master of the Spider Throne? Uh, I think I've heard that one. I didn't run into it when I was taking notes. Yeah, that, that's a good that's one. That's a good one. My favorite, though, like for sure, is the whispered one. The whispered one is like, that's like classic. Yeah. You want to put, that makes me want to do a Vecna campaign where the PCs go into the village and everyone's like, the whispered one. Right. I fucking love it. Yeah. Here's another really cool thing, and this is very relevant again to 5e D&D, is Vecna took a young demon as an apprentice, and this apprentice's name was Aserarak. Oh, right. Who feature, he's featured on the front of the DMG for 5e. And he also is the villain in Tomb of Horrors. Yeah, he's a very powerful lich as well now. People say um, the Tomb of Horrors is the deadliest dungeon ever. Gygax made it because you had players who they released uh, deities and demigods, which gave gods stat blocks. So if you do that, then players want to kill. They know what they need to do to kill that god. So you had all these characters who are like, I've killed Thor, and I've killed this guy. You know, I've killed all these, so Gygax, I guess, was like, fine. You want a dungeon? I'll make you a dungeon. Nice. So apparently, at least the original, I don't know about the 5e version, but it's supposed to be real brutal. Nice. I love that. That's so crazy. cool. Yeah. Um, I don't know, like, if you have this, but uh, I want to definitely touch on this, on this, the beginnings of Vecna that you're talking about. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a... Uh, they were there's like a few ideas because with Vecna's lore like it's really fun because some of it could be lies some of it could be truth some of it could be interpretations of a truth so you really have a lot to play with and some of the stuff I saw what that he was he was infamously known for being cruel like insanely right. cruel yeah yeah um, that's in uh, I think Vecna lives it has a blurb about his yeah, cruelty yeah. and uh and he, I think he was also known as like the master of lies or mm. something that was another title like he he lied a lot and a lot of his magic items he would create false lore around and oh nice to, uh there's also yeah. the rumor that on the in the Greyhawk world that he's responsible for the bright desert there's a huge desert and they say he's responsible for it does that have the volcano in the middle of it uh, I would honestly have to look at it, but that sounds... Because I think that's one of the locations. There's an old school D&D. It was much harder to destroy the Hand and Eye Vecna, mm. but you could throw them into a volcano. I think you had to do something first, but I think it's the one in the in desert. In the desert? That yeah. would make total sense because yeah. that's, that's the rumor of that. So thought I'd throw those little pieces out there. No, that's awesome. Yeah, those are good. 
Um, Vecna, and this is very important to Vecna's evolution, but uh, Vecna had a bodyguard named Cass, the oh, bloody handed. Such a big part of it. Uh, Vecna made a sword for Cass, and he supposedly for I love the phrasing of this. He supposedly forged the sword from iron of a frozen star in the flames of the sun. So it's like Jesus. I have it fire stolen from the sun. Oh, that's even cool. Like that's yeah. I was like, damn, that's good wording right there. That is good wording. Did you run into the idea that either Vecna put part of Vecna's self into the sword or part of Cass's? Um I honestly the details were vague on that. Right. Uh I it's intelligent, but I think no one's sure why if it was an if it was intentional or if it was because of the materials used, but I honestly don't know. Right. Cuz there's I ran into that it was they took a part of Cass's consciousness. Could be. Or they took a part of Vecna's. Like I ran into that. I was like, "Huh. That's cool." I think it's another one of those things where it's kind of open to the DM's interpretation. Yeah. Um, it's the same thing with the hand and the eye. Originally, they didn't have any powers automatically assigned to them. The DM would assign them. Uh-huh. So every every version of the hand and the eye were supposed to be slightly unique That's cool. versions of it. But for whatever reason, the sword convinced Cast to turn on Vecna. Yeah. He basically told him like he was better. They fought an epic uh battle and the end of which that's when Vecna lost his eye and his hand and the the kind of aftermath the rubble like the commoners went and searched the rubble there was no sign except for the sword the uh eye and the hand were all found yeah um, and then Cass eventually becomes a vampire lord mm-hmm. in one of the domains of dread which I'm like that's insane I mean that's that's a pretty good scope of like his legend right there. The yeah, he basically becomes a god. He he tries to invade Sigil, which is the Planescape city. I think most of the adventures can have it where you you can fail too. But right. in the overall meta mythology, I think he loses and then he gets banished somewhere. But that's about it for that. So nice. That's kind of his history in a nutshell. Very kind of broad brush. But. Yeah, and he's also I want to definitely touch on this as we say this. The imagery that they've conjured up for Vecna has evolved as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, like, his original look compared to even what they have now is very different. Mm -hmm. But I'll definitely say that if we can, we'll link some uh, versions of Vecna that we've seen. Mm -hmm. I definitely want to touch on what I thought was super cool was the critical role Vecna. Mm-hmm. The uh, miniature they use is actually a Warhammer miniature oh, nice. that they like modified. That's cool to create this thing and kit bashed yeah, it. And I'll sh- uh, we'll see if we can post up a picture of it because uh, it was it's such a cool mini. Like it's really big and super epic looking. Nice Citadel's on point with their miniature. Yeah, those making for oh sure. man, it's so good. But I lo- yeah. The uh, I love hearing the version that you just kind of told because, like I said, I've I like researched the Critical Role version of Vecna, mm-hmm. uh, and it follows a very very similar background. Uh, it talks more about the uh, his kind of his tower, you know the uh, the Obsidian yeah, Tower. Yeah, the Obsidian. Uh, mm-hmm. where I have it. Apparently, that's an innovation. It was never known to be Obsidian until kind of modern era. Oh, nice. So in the the Vecna I looked about, his uh, he went to the Shadowfell to the old city Tharamfala, and rose mm-hmm. this uh, this blacked tower, which was called mm-hmm. uh, what is it called? I had it written down somewhere. I just don't know where. Regardless, uh, it was like this jagged, gnarly looking black tower in the middle of this city in the Shadowfell. Mm-hmm. I was like, God, that sounds so cool. And that's the place in this mythology where somebody came to attack Vecna while he was trying to do his ascension to godhood. And they uh, Vecna defeats them. Mm-hmm. And as he's all tired and wounded, that's when Cass shows up. Mm. And they have their battle right then. So he's already like drained right. of all his shit. And that's why yeah. it, it destroys Vecna's tower. Mm-hmm. And the only thing left is the sword, the eye, and the hand. Okay. So, 
to interject really yeah. quick, and again, spoiler alert, there is this weird conspiracy thing going around about 5e where some of the campaign modules, these black obsidian obelisks keep showing up. Uh huh. And again, credit to Jordan, the PH is silent. Um, he has a list. So Princes of the Apocalypse, Out of the Abyss, Storm King's Thunder, Tome of Annihilation or Tomb of Annihilation, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Descent into Avernus, and Rime of the Frost Maiden. That's all of that's all the big that's all the good like the big ones. That's all the big ones, yeah. So people are like they've never described Vecna's tower as obsidian before, and he now has control of time. Yeah. Apparently, as well, in some fashion. And so they think that they're there's a meta plot advancement going on slowly that D and D five E kind of has this Marvel plan, like where they have like years in advance, they have some kind of big event. They're uh, they're starting to get ready to it. And revealing Vecna's stat block just as season four of Stranger Things comes out featuring Vecna, it just it's very timely. Right. Oh it's, say that. It's so crazy so. too to like see I remember when I heard that they were calling this villain Vecna, I was like, that's awesome. That's yeah. such a cool thing to to bring back. Because, I mean, just like we keep saying, Vecna is one of those iconic aspects in Dungeons & Dragons. Like, mm-hmm. it's super, super big. Um, mm-hmm. do you, uh, do you, what, what else you got over there, bro? So, for new stuff, one thing that is... A- traditional uh with vecna that has changed is he's never i don't think he's ever had a stat block before that's what people keep saying so the fact that he now has a stat block is kind of unprecedented Mm. um i haven't looked through the adventures so i could be wrong on that front but that's what i keep hearing so that's again really odd the art has completely changed from what you find on the um Magic the Gathering D&D expansion if you look at Vecna and you look at the eye and the hand, totally different. Mm. Now that could just be artistic license. Yeah. But it's a little odd if they're using, you know, creating kind of these certain villains to look a certain way that would be completely different. Like the eye of Vecna in the magic card looks like a cat's eye. Oh. So it's different. Do you know what's super crazy? Huh. These All of these items are in Spellfire. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And Spellfire used a bunch of like the D and D art of the time, and yeah. the Book of Vile Darkness looks totally different. Yeah, and now it says in the block that he's formed his body to hold the Book of Vile Darkness in his basically rib cage. Yeah. Now, so if you look at the art for Vecna, the new art, yeah, and I thought this was interesting because the very bottom paragraph of just the flavor says the accompanying stat block depicts Vecna in his arch lich form prior to Cass's betrayal. So this is a younger Vecna, and that's why he's got his eye in his hand. And then it says that because Vecna is said to have mastered magic, allowing him to travel through time, he can appear in this form even on worlds where his severed hand and eye have already are already known artifacts. So that's a really weird... That, like, okay, you read it and you're like, all right, but if you think about what that means, you could be potentially face young Vecna and old Vecna. Like, mm-hmm. how many Vecnas are there? Is it Rick and Morty type situation where there's the Council of Vecnas? Like, well, it could be. What's, like, hap- what's happening right now? Well, when you, like, when you put the idea of that multiverse out there... Yeah. I mean, like, who who is Vecna now? Is he this one that walks between all... Like, right, or is he like basically an ancient epic dragon that like he's gathered the echoes of himself into one being, and now he's he's like the only one, but he can do crazy shit that you know normal liches can't. Let's say that's so crazy, man. Like, yeah. Um, well, like the book of vile darkness being part of him now. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Because what they've what has been written about the book before, now this is just again researching this, finding what we could. It says what I found out is that the original was penned by a spellcaster a long time ago, mm-hmm. and it doesn't actually choose Vecna as the one. Mm. And it also says that it was a it wasn't even like a book; it was basically a scroll. Mm. Okay. So it started out as this, and then that. Uh, it would fall into the hands of different 
powerful people and they would add to it. Right, kind of there's been multiple authors throughout mm. the ages. So eventually on, how do you say it, or, Oith? Oith. Oith. We gotta go down to Oith. We gotta go down to Oith. Vecna got it, mm-hmm. and he's the one, what it appears to be, the one that kind of is credited for binding it into a book of... Compiling it. Right, and they this the way they describe the original one is like, you know, the, the ink is blood, the... The whole thing mm-hmm. is flesh and demon flesh. and It's like a Necronomicon. Yeah, basically. it's really yeah. brutal. Yeah. And the other thing they talk about is that there are actually six perfect copies that existed in the beginning. Mm. Um, and some of the stuff that can happen to you, like as far as a being in-game type thing, rather than its, its lore, mm-hmm. it is wild. Yeah. Uh, if you're a good person and you've touch this book it will hurt you and i mean as per huge on the older versions of D&D, especially second edition and back like if you pick up a crazy epic evil item like that it usually instantly changes your alignment and a whole bunch of stuff just flips a lot of the time like um another interesting thing along with the book of vile darkness is the only way known to kill vecna at this point is to uh, you have to apply the hand of Vecna onto a hand like an arm that's had its hand cut off, and then you have to have the sword of Cass. Oof. But as soon as you put on the hand of Vecna, you instantly become evil. And there's all these curses that are laid on you, like yeah. along with the powers, like you're basically ruined. Well, it's it's funny that you talk about defeating Vecna mm-hmm. because I have the whole thing here about the idea one of the idea of how they defeated Vecna in Critical Role Mm -hmm. and what's super interesting is this is something I found out during research for this because I I, I've skipped forward and I've actually listened to those last few episodes of Critical Role and the Vecna fight Mm -hmm. and it's really cool but what was interesting is they didn't actually kill Vecna then they banish him? They put him outside of, basically, they lock him on the other side of this kind of planar door. Mm-hmm. And since he doesn't have a home realm, he's just wandering now. Mm-hmm. And can't really get to any of the places he knows, but they definitely didn't kill him. Mm-hmm. Um, and the whole process that they did to defeat him is so cool and so epic. Because it's like, just the Vecna fight is two episodes of their story. It's like eight hours. And of each one of them is play. like six to seven hours. So it is a huge battle that happens. It's really cool. If you're into listening to that stuff, definitely check it out. If you don't care about listening to the whole build up to that, because uh, it's pretty epic. Most people, I will say this, most people are a little put off because Critical Role is like a full actual play. It's about the size, usually the the size of a real session yeah so sometimes it's better to start with something like adventure zone or yeah. oh, glass yeah. cannon something where it's like an hour each episode's like an hour long right. but that being said if if you can get into it critical role will pay off for sure but i loved the reading through this like if you are if you're neutral mm-hmm. and you touch the book you're definitely going to start becoming more evil yeah uh it has the ability to hide information from people so if you it doesn't want you to know this certain topic, it hides that stuff from you. As you just a, can never turn to the right page. Right. It just won't yeah. work. It's super interesting to me yeah. how they made this book of vile darkness. Now, let's jump over to the Monty Cook book for 3, 3.5 that he wrote mm-hmm. called The Book of Vile Darkness. Mm-hmm. Funny enough, there is literally no mention of Vecna in that book. No, not anywhere. When was it written? What? Uh, uh, you know, you know, that's a good what's question. What's the publishing date? I have to pull it up. Uh, hold on. Publishing date. 2002. Oh, that's interesting. Um, but what it really contains is a lot of like really brutal, evil stuff for campaigns. Like It kind of identifies mechanics for uh, trigger warning here for anyone listening. Uh, torture. Mm-hmm. Uh, crucifixion, all sorts of like gnarly stuff, blood rituals, uh, torture devices that bad guys can carry around. Like, like that really highlights the evil gods and like 
mechanics to making your campaign have a the evil feels like it's evil uh, not just a bad guy but someone that's truly like an evil sorcerer or an evil something i think too especially back like during second edition that it was totally calm and you could do a good campaign that was like good default but you could definitely do evil campaigns right too and i mean you know it's a different culture now right and the supplement book book of vile darkness does have the kind of instructions if you will on how to run a party that wants to be evil or Mm -hmm. like a a good party with one evil pc right it has a lot of information on how to do that and uh just like anything we talk about in the beginning it definitely says make sure you talk to your players don't just spring don't spring this stuff on them this is some dark heavy adult stuff don't just plop this into your game without making sure people are okay with it Mm -hmm. which after after reading a chunk of that i i definitely am like oh man next campaign i run i want there to be some evil deeds that happen within the world i think it'd be cool if if you're gonna do it make it pertinent to the campaign you're playing even if you're doing sandbox and you don't have like a story arc worked out in advance right. but there it's something part of the world that the characters have to deal with they you know it's hard for them just to ignore it right like it's it's a problem in the world you know like yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe your characters are torturers oh. like you know <laughs> yeah. getting them to struggle with that it's not just easy for them so they're not necessarily completely evil or something. Mm. Something I think you could handle it well, but of course everybody who's there would have to be okay with it. You know, oh, yeah. definitely have to have to have some uh, some chats with mm. your uh, a lot of chats. With your gaming group for sure. Uh, Pretty crazy, no? Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say there's there's a lot of stuff on even just the the mythology or not even mythology, kind of like the nature of the in game item the book of vile darkness Mm -hmm. and it's interesting uh you know Mm -hmm. obviously it can be used as a spell focus yeah yeah Uh, for sure yeah that's i mean i feel like that's good for the for that yeah it's a super interesting topic i definitely want to read through those the three vecna adventures Mm -hmm. uh, just to get a sense because each one and you find this a lot i feel like even in dnd today is each kind of adventure module will have lore that kind of furthers the setting or the mythology of something. Like, you know, there's stuff in Tomb of Annihilation that's not like standard rules or different backgrounds and those mm. kind of things. Oh, yeah, you yeah. Know? So, um, it's cool. One thing we didn't talk about in the history is that uh, from the first adventure Vecna lives, he actually kills the Circle of Eight. Oh, dude. And the Circle of Eight, for those of you who don't know, if you play D&D and you're familiar with the spells at all, you should recognize some of these names as having the names are attached to certain spells. So like Big B. Big B's what, Magic Hand? Yeah, Big B's Crushing Fist or whatever. This one I don't know. Uh, Draw Mige. D-R-A-W-M-I-J. But I'm guessing there's probably some spell somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um... What is that one? Jalarzi? Salivarian? You can tell these are player character names. Right. Uh, Nystal? Definitely some uh, magic named after him. Autoluke has some too. And each one that... Because there's pregens for these characters. Because the DM just hands them out to players. Right. Because you actually play through them getting killed. And that's why Colville doesn't like this adventure. Because it's super railroady, I guess. Right. Like, you just get to kill the Circle of Eight just, like, on DM Fiat. Like, oh, you're dead now. Right. Oh, you're dead. Oh, Jimmy, your character's dead. Right. Which I'm, which I'm like, yeah, that's brutal if it's not really flashback. You know, you're just kind of making them play through the track. Right. Um, Auto. I think uh, Rary. I think Tensor's in here, too. Yeah, like Tensor's Floating Disc. Yeah. So these are the magicians who a lot of, like, the spells are named after. And Colville points out that that also means that all these spells that are around have either been discovered or invented recently, like Fireball and Magic Missile and blah, blah, blah. And in, like, old-school pulp fantasy, 
uh, especially in like um, Dying Earth, there's only like a hundred spells around. And there, I was telling Ian before we started recording, one wizard knows all the spells. Most wizards know like one or two. So it's interesting that that idea. We we have a lot of spells now, but that idea has carried over for a long time up to I would say third edition where. There weren't a ton of spells. Right. There was a small collection of spells, and most of them had been like recovered from dungeons, or they were reworked versions of older spells. From like, you know, magicians are kind of like scientists in that way, where they have to be researching and experimenting, and that'd be fun to do as a player. Like, if you were in the right campaign, where your character's in dungeons, but they're really concerned with research and finding new spells, and that's why they're there, you know. Right. So I think that's cool too. But yeah, I really like this. I definitely think we need to do, you know, like look into Tiamat and some other icons. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, do do this again for sure. So Legends and And you know, anybody listening, maybe there's some Vecna I'm sure there is, but there's some Vecna lore we missed that you know that you're like, Wait, this other thing is really cool or hey, yeah. you got that detail wrong. Say something in the comments. Be like tippy tap tap. Right. Or messages Actually. or anything, you know. Yeah. Oh, one thing too is I did buy on Audible. I bought the first Dying Earth book. Oh, cool. So I'm gonna start listening through it. I gotta uh, listen to Six of Crows first, but but yeah, Ian, mm. close us out. Give us a thought. Uh, well, a closing thought. Through researching Vecna through all of these different worlds, there's still, I mean, obviously a lot we didn't even talk about. But what's what my my closing thought is this: If there is a something within any edition of D and D that you love, or any iconic thing, spend the time to work it into your game if you want to. So uh, right. it's a lot of really interesting things that you might stumble on researching any character through anything that you're like, oh man, this could inspire an entire adventure arc. Right. Or in a whole campaign, even. And with that, make sure to stay sweaty. Use force damage. Force damage. Like, subscribe.